Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of this week's talks in the London Luminaries Autumn Series, 14 historic properties working together to share our collective heritage. Well, I'm Chris Harry, a volunteer at Marble Hill. Now, I hope you haven't had dinner yet, because tonight's talk is going to leave you reaching for the larder door or summoning the kitchen staff. But now, let me introduce our own modern day London luminary, who will chair this evening's proceedings, Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you so much, Chris, for that introduction. Thank you for hosting. Thank you to all the other people working behind the scenes. And most of all, thank you to our audience. Many of you have been with us from the earlier series, and it's really a delight to know that we're continuing our engagement with you. Some of you will be watching later on on the YouTube channel. But if you are here watching live, there are lots of connections between our talks over the, the course of the series. Obviously, we have the, the theme of food and drink. Now, I'm delighted that today we have a double act. We have, let's say, the, um, the Astaire and Rogers of the West London art scene. Our two speakers, Dr. Matthew Morgan and Catherine Parry Wingfield. Very good to have you both here. So first, let me introduce Dr. Matthew Morgan, who is the, the museum director of Turner's House in Twickenham and is also an associate lecturer at Birkbeck University of London. Just as Turner loved to invite friends to his house for, for drinks and food, Matthew is also keen to hear from people who'd like to hire the house as a, as a venue for their own entertainments or um, artistic events. And like Turner, Matthew has been fascinated by the ways in which our central experiences affect our aesthetic ones. Our second speaker is Catherine Parry Wingfield, who has spoken in the Luminaries series before. Catherine is an art historian with a special interest in Turner. She's contributed in many ways to the restoration and public accessibility of his house at, at Sandycombe Lodge. For example, Catherine has twice run fundraising suppers for Turner's house around Turner's birthday in April, with a very bad pun by way of a title, the Turner Pies. Uh, this may be due to be retitled, not the Turner Prize. You will find various references to pies during this talk. Matthew, over to you. Judith, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here um, and I'm also delighted to be uh, referred to or, or likened to uh, Ginger Rogers. Um, I don't think you have seen me dance. I'm going to just very briefly um, try and um, talk us through some of the developments that uh, people in Britain saw with regard to food um, in the um, late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, when I finish this um, extremely rapid run through, um, I'm going to hand over to Catherine, who's going to talk specifically about some of the things that uh, we know that Turner ate. It's not really easy, I think, to sum up the tastes of an era. Uh, fashions change, there are regional variations, changes in class, changes in, um, in, in, in uh, gender, and there usually there is no clearly defined end of one taste or the beginning of its successor. This is a lovely sketch by Turner of uh, an interior with a kitchen, and I hope you can all see the uh, kitchen inside, uh, um, cooking utensils everywhere, but also the little oven uh, somewhat in the center of this sketch upon which all the cooking would have been done. I think it is possible, um, despite some of the caveats that I mentioned just now, to say with certainty though, that during Turner's lifetime, food, its purchase, preparation, the ways in which it was consumed, all saw dramatic and um, irrevocable changes. Uh, across Britain, food became more varied, more widely available for many sections of society, but by no means all. Because although food was plentiful in some places, um, it was also a period of the direst poverty, failed harvests, food riots, and actual uh, famines. But it was also a period in which food became increasingly commented on in a growing popular press and through a, a boom in cookbooks. And at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, there were an ever-increasing number of people in England who had access to an international 
um, a, a, a variety of foods, continental foods such as pasta and Parmesan cheese, foods that we think of you as ubiquitous, such as sandwiches were invented and popularized, and um, items such as tea and coffee and sugar became much more important, in particular tea somehow became the most English of drinks. We can also see that there was a growing fashion for French eating and uh, French manners, and this also changed the ways in which people um, thought about food. If um, we think about the ways in which people ate, and uh, I love this Rowlandson uh, print, which perhaps shows the uh, disparity of uh, availability of food. We have a table of uh, church wardens eating and drinking heartily while they are physically ejecting uh, people who do not have any food from the front. And I think it's just important to bear in mind that while I'm going to talk about some of the food that people ate, um, it was not uh, an era in which food was um, equally spread around the country. It's also, I think, just worth bearing in mind that um, we may, I may be talking about food that we don't know for sure whether Turner ate, but in the world in which he lived, he would almost certainly have been aware of all of these developments in just the same way as um, in this part of the 21st century, and certainly in London, I don't think it's possible that there is anybody who doesn't know what a flat white is, uh, or increasingly, as I seem to be finding, being offered a wine from England, um, which I'm constantly surprised about. But Turner would have been aware uh, of these changes in um, his world as well, even if he didn't drink English wine or uh, flat whites. It's not uncommon nowadays to be told that, that we have too much food and that we all overeat. Um, yet in 1825, uh, we have records that in London, there were uh, 24,000 calves butchered, uh, 1.5 million sheep, and just over 20,000 pigs. Um, and that's an enormous amount of uh, livestock, particularly when you consider the uh, smaller size of London compared to now. And actually, if you compare them to figures uh, for 21st century London, they are not wildly dissimilar. There was an enormous amount of food that was available. And even if I said before, as I've said before, uh, it was not equally spread. Just also um, wanted to show this uh, image by Rowlandson, um, one of the um, uh, common features in food of this era is an increasing use of sugar. And with an increasing use of sugar came a, a boom in, or rather a sort of decline in dental hygiene and a boom in um, uh, of, of dentists. And here we have people having their teeth uh, pulled out. I particularly like the figure in the middle uh, looking at himself in the mirror, and I hope you can see his uh, snaggle teeth, uh, possibly a reason that we don't see so many people smiling in paintings by Reynolds or um, Gainsborough. How do we know what people ate in this period? Well, um, there a, a, was a, rather an increase in uh, books uh, about the um, habits of people in society. Um, ultimately, uh, hopefully, in order to correct some of these habits. And in 1797, uh, Frederick Morton Eden published his uh, The State of the Poor, uh, A History of the Labouring Classes in England. In it, he provided a weekly account of the expenses for families across England. And it's an absolutely fascinating reference to find out what people were actually eating. From this, we can see that most people bought bread, flour, and oats, and that these were the staples uh, across the country of many diets and many meals. But we can also see that people spent a lot of their wages on meat. And this supports the popular impression that this was a very carnivorous period. We can also see that uh, people spent significant amounts on what we might think of as luxuries, or even then possibly were luxuries, tea and sugar being uh, at the top, but also butter. Tea and sugar, of course, imported items. And from this data, we can see that carbohydrates and meat 
uh, washed down with lots of tea, uh, were the most common ingredients of meals that many people had. And maybe in some ways, not much has substantially changed. We still eat a lot of carbohydrates, people still eat a lot of meat, and still is, and tea is still, in, is still in very popular. This is um, a, uh, I think, slightly atypical picture by Turner of a cottage kitchen. Uh, can't quite see what the lady is cooking, but uh, perhaps she is um, cooking some uh, meat um, and using some flour. In more urban areas, there was a far greater variety of food available. By the late 18th century, pasta was being imported into England, uh, particularly macaroni and vermicelli, um, and in large amounts. Uh, the macaronis, of which this is a fantastic uh, image here, were young men who had come back from their grand tours and wanted to continue to eat their favorite Italian dish, macaroni. They formed the macaroni club, and whenever they met, a huge dish of macaroni was placed on the table. I love that image. Uh, a bit like the mods in the 60s, uh, as well as liking food, the macaronis loved the foreign and exotic in fashion. And as you can see here, they uh, particularly liked rather uh, 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 exuberant wigs. However, by the beginning of the 19th century, the eating of pasta was much more widely spread, and people who had never been to Italy were eating it in large amounts. So much so that by 1820, there were even concerns in the press and in Parliament that sufficient amounts of pasta were being illegally imported into Britain and evading tax, and that this represented a serious financial problem for the country. Hard to believe that people were eating that much pasta. At about the same sort of time, um, continental cheeses were becoming increasingly available in London. For instance, there was an increasing demand, uh, along with pasta, for a uh, Parmesan cheese. I uh, should point out that the first recorded evidence of Parmesan coming to the country was actually in 1511, when Henry VIII was, was given some by the Pope. However, um, I think the point is that uh, it was far more available for far more people. Also throughout the 18th and 19th century, uh, improvements in transport systems meant that food could be more widely accessible across the nation. Um, in, um, uh, in comparison to uh, previous periods where uh, food was very often transported uh, along coasts and along rivers. This meant that fish particularly, which for many centuries had been treated with suspicion, if not served uh, near the sea or close to a river, became far more common. Before refrigeration, fish would have become rancid very quickly. And if there was any fish left at the end of the day in any of the markets, it was usually bought by some of the poorer people. And this may explain why oysters and eels were by the end of the 18th century, very popular as street food. Um, they weren't expensive and they appealed to a market that were perhaps not put off by fishy smells. Here's one of my favorite of Turner's depictions of people selling fish on the beach. Uh, just having been caught, and it must have been amazingly fresh. In this period, ingredients um, and recipes, certainly in London, were becoming increasingly international. For instance, during the Regency, increasing numbers of people were settling in London from India, either Europeans who had been working there for the East India Company or inhabitants of the subcontinent. One of these it was Dean Mohammed, who we can see here. He was born to a Muslim family, uh, but moved to Cork in Ireland after following an officer from the East India Company. But by 1809, he had moved to London and he opened the Hindustani coffee house in Portman Square. Its opening uh, managed to be announced in the Times and he, it was described as offering Indian dishes of the highest perfection. I love this because if Turner had wanted to visit, he was only a very short walk away, uh, having been or living in Queen Anne Street. Sadly, Mohammed went bust and uh, that wasn't good. However, he ended up by working for the Prince Regent um, in the pavilion in Brighton and went on to popularize shampoo, but that's a whole other story. But what we can see from the Hindustani coffee house is that a wide range of spices were available in London. Coriander, turmeric, pepper, ginger, cardamom, uh, all of these um, imported from um, elsewhere. And we can also see in this period that the first uh, recipes for curry started to appear in English cookbooks. Um, there's still a way to go until those are the ubiquity of ingredients that we have today. But I think it's the start of an interna internationalization of tastes in this country. 
To get an idea of the kinds of food that were prepared, we can look at cookbooks and household manuals. And these proliferated in the 18th century and the early 19th century, partly due to the unusual, for Europe anyway, levels of literacy in England. But they also reflect changes in society. Previously, rich people had relied on servants to cook and poorer people had learned from their families. But with the rising middle classes, there was a demand for people, mainly women, uh, to do their own cooking and also to try new recipes. So I thought I'd give you um, just two examples of recipes from very popular cookbooks of the period. Of course, we have no idea if Turner or his dad uh, had tried any of these, but um, given that many hundreds of copies of these were sold, it seems to me not impossible that Turner might have been served something similar as a guest uh, of friends or even uh, out in an eating establishment. Hannah Glass's um, Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, which we see here, was one of the best-selling cookery books of the period. Uh, in her time, she was as well known as uh, Nigella Lawson is today. And here's her recipe for lamb's head. To dress lamb's head, boil the head and pluck tender, but don't let the liver be too much done. Take the head up, hack it cross and cross with a knife. Grate some nutmeg over it and lay it in a dish before a good fire. Then grate some crumbs of bread, some sweet herbs rubbed, a little lemon peel chopped fine, a very little pepper and salt and baste it with a little butter. Then throw a little flour over it. And just as is it done, do the same, baste and dredge it. Take half the liver, the lights, the heart, the tongue, chop them very small and with six or seven spoonfuls of gravy or water. First, shake some flour off the meat and stir it together. Then put in the gravy or water, a good piece of butter rolled in a little flour, a little pepper and salt, and what runs from the head in a dish. Simmer all together for a few minutes and add half a spoonful of vinegar. Pour it into your dish. Lay the head in the middle of the minced meat. Have ready the other half of the liver cut thin with some slices of bacon broiled and lay around the head. Garnish the dish with lemon and send it to the table. I must say that doesn't sound like a, a particularly good meal for me, but um, it was very popular in its time. Another uh, dish pro uh, produced, uh, prepared rather by uh, William Verrill, who was a tavern cook, um, does sound to me to be uh, a lot more uh, tasty. This is his recipe for strawberry fritters, which were apparently a holiday food, particular popular, particularly popular at Easter. The strawberries must be dry. Leave the stalks on for easier handling. Sip the flour into a bowl and add the caster sugar and nutmeg. Make a well and drop the eggs and cream. Then stir until all the flour and sugar are gradually assimilated. Let the batter stand for an hour or two. Dip each cherry in batter until it is completely coated and fry a few at a time in hot lard. Your lard must be hot enough to puff them, but not so hot as to brown them too quickly. Pile them up in a myriad in a hot dish and sprinkle sugar all over. Mmm. Constable and Turner were famous rivals, and although Constable described Turner as having a wonderful range of mind, he also called him uncouth. And in this period, food became increasingly important, not just uh, its consumption, but also as a social signifier, as it always has been in some ways. The extravagance of parties and dinners hosted by the aristocracy were repeated, although on a far smaller scale, uh, across the country, particularly in the middle classes. Inviting people for meals that started at midday and ended at night was not uncommon. And just as we do today, people wanted to impress their guests, not only with the food, but the way in which it was consumed. And I'm showing this wonderful image of the Brighton Pavilion uh, to perhaps sort of show what uh, some people were aiming towards. Yet this seems not always to have been the case at Sandycombe. As with so many things, Turner seems to have uh, deliberately defied fashion. Uh, a meal in the house was described thus. Everything was of the most modest pretension. Two pronged forks and knives with large round ends for taking up the food. The tablecloth barely covering the table and the earthenware was in strict keeping. At this time in France, the three pronged fork had been in general use for at least 50 years. Um, and it suddenly started to become more popular in England. It, however, having said that, it was still used in many uh, inns in England. And increasingly in polite society, people were eating uh, while sat at a table, surrounded by attractive ceramic wares, by silver uh, and other bits of cutlery. And the etiquette expected of a person of quality can be seen in this quote by Antoine de Cortin's rule of civility. Having served yourself with your spoon, 
you must remember to wipe it. And indeed, as often as you use it, for some are so nice, they will not eat porridge or anything of that nature in which you have put your spoon unwiped after you have put it in your own mouth. The reason that the cutlery was specifically pointed out at Sandikan was to show that the table, if not the architecture, was distinctly old fashioned. And we can see how changes in society did not happen equally by the reference that Turner is still using this old fashioned uh, form of cutlery. And in this print by Gilray, the reason I'm showing it, I hope you can see, is that the uh, figure on the left, it's William Pitt, is using a French three-pronged fork, while Napoleon on the right uses a British two-pronged fork, meaning that actually the two of them are not so very different as they might like to make out. In the late 18th century and early 19th century, towns were crowded with street traders, markets, coffee shops, eating houses, thieves, and sometimes prostitutes. Food was predominantly sold in markets and by street sellers. Uh, food shops per se were uh, very rare um, outside of London. Markets were usually open from five or six to seven at night, uh, six days a week. And ingredients were of course seasonal. However, increased transport meant that some luxury goods were available further afield. And for instance, in 1775, it was reported in the St. James Chronicle that a fine barrel of Whitby cod had arrived and was for sale in the Salisbury Cheese Cross Market. This is an example of fish being rapidly shipped from the coast. I think it also, I also like the fact that at the same market, you could buy Seville oranges and lemons, pickled sturgeon and oysters in jars, obviously the place to go. I want to focus very briefly on Covent Garden, partly because it was uh, Turner's birthplace, but also because of uh, fruit and vegetable market. Uh, I love this image by uh, the Dutch painter Angelis. Uh, I think you can see some of the uh, life that was there. Uh, just want to uh, share this account by the journalist Richard Steele, who took a boat up from Putney, where he soon fell in with a fleet of gardeners. I landed with 10 sail of apricot boats at Strand Bridge after having put in at nine elms and taken in melons. We arrived at Strandbridge at six o'clock of the clock and were unloading when the hackney coachmen of the foregoing night took their leave of each other. I could not believe any place more entertaining than Covent Garden, where I strolled from one fruit shop to another with crowds of agreeable young women around me who were purchasing fruit for their respective families. Perhaps this is one of the agreeable young women he was talking about. The pineapples, um, sorry, the apricots and melons that he mentioned were grown in Vauxhall and specialist pits, but so were pineapples, broccoli, uh, tomatoes, lettuce, carrots and onions. Uh, you could get all of those grown not very far away from where Turner's house now is. Milk was also available in Covent Garden, and this is a print from, or uh, one of the prints from The Cries of London by Francis Wheatley, an attempt to show the rapid diversity and pleasure to be had in London. And these milkmaids walked the streets, uh, shouting their wares, uh, and some even brought their cows along and would milk them at your door. So how was your food prepared? This is Gainsborough's portrait of a Count Rumford, uh, or uh, Benjamin Graf von Rumford, um, or as he was christened, uh, Benjamin Thompson. Uh, Rumford was born in America and he moved to England and Germany where he got his title. Rumford uh, designed some, one of the earliest ovens and his um, idea uh, was to um, introduce the uh, a cover, covering over of the far for most households, uh, kitchens were basically a far onto which you put your pots. But Rumford had the rather wonderful uh, and sensible idea of covering the uh, kitchen. And we can see two of them here, uh, covering them at the top with an iron plate so that the flames of the far would warm the front and the sides. And here is Gilray wonderfully showing Rumford warming himself uh, against uh, a, um, a, a one of his ovens. Um, he was so successful, Rumford, that he was asked to modify the Foundling Hospital kitchen, which he did, and he made it much more efficient. And I also love this um, Rowlandson print on the right. Um, if I can ask you to sort of look away from the uh, gambling people just for a moment to the left, um, and you will see an early stove on which is a, um, a, a, a kettle boiling. Kitchen utensils were also important. Um, many of them um, were so important that they were stolen. A total of 371 incidents relating to kitchen thefts were recorded. 
uh, between 1714 and 1830, um, including the theft of silver plate, uh, mugs, uh, ladles, tongs, basins, kettles, tea caddies, frying pans, uh, many of which made of copper or pewter rather than silver. Um, and um, if caught, um, these thieves risked being uh, sentenced to death or transported if they were lucky. We see here this rather unhappy kitchen. Um, and um, the reason I'm showing this slide is if we look around, I hope you can see the utensils, the copper pots, the cutlery, the salt and pepper cellars. So even in a kitchen as unhappy as this, uh, there were all of these um, uh, desirable uh, utensils. And I thought I'd very quickly finish my section with this well-known image of the uh, great gourmand of his time, the Prince Regent. As I hope you have seen in this incredibly rapid overview of food and eating during Turner's lifetime, the ingredients available to cooks and the way in which people uh, cook the food that they got uh, were rapidly changing during Turner's lifetime. Now, I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, Catherine, who is going to tell us uh, in far greater detail about what Turner ate. Well, thank you, Matthew. I wanted to start by thinking just a little bit about meal times. In the early 19th century, for the reasonably well off and above, breakfast was late, it was bakery orientated, Jane Austen mentions muffins and so on. And for the leisured classes, uh, they would in the mid morning take cakes, honey cake was particularly popular, and other snacks. They would have chocolate and tea. Lunch doesn't really become established till a little bit later in the 19th century. Dinner, about five, long and heavy. Uh, soup, fish, meat, pies, dessert, sweetmeats, marzipan, particularly popular at that time. And for the leisured classes, though, our man Turner, of course, is not really leisured. But if there were balls or theatre, there would be supper afterwards. I think, as Matthew's indicated, people had a much closer relationship with their food than we do now. And Matthew said, uh, reminded us all that Turner was born in Covent Garden and indeed Billingsgate fish market was not that far away. In Twickenham, his little country retreat, cattle would probably have been driven down Sandy Lane past Sandy Coombe Lodge. I think the most important thing, one of the great attractions of, of Twickenham and that particular, or not quite Twickenham, but outside Twickenham, the nearness of the Thames, just a short walk away from Sandy Coombe Lodge and the river itself, uh, a great source of food. Turner, a keen fisherman, and he liked nothing more than, as one friend put it, angling out the day. So you're combining sport with dinner, and those fish would find their way, if they weren't devoured the same evening, uh, in the large pond in, in his garden, to await uh, a later call to the table, I think you might call it. One of Turner's rods is still in the Royal Academy in their collection. Uh, he certainly had quite a number and fishermen appear in a number of his paintings. There was salmon in the Thames, a wonderful source of food all round. People, as Matthews pointed out, fish was treated with a certain amount of um, suspicion, but certainly was becoming much more available and favorable. The Thames also had many eels and eel traps appear in a lot of Turner's paintings. I should just say that unless I put something different on the label, um, then everything you see is, is relates, to, relates to Turner's own work. This is just a detail, an engraving after an oil painting of Turner's of 1808, showing eel traps and behind the sheep, uh, gently grazing, you can see a punt with other commercial eel traps in, in that punt. People also caught eels just for fun, but I think not with traps like this, but John Sohn, for instance, Turner's great friend, the architect, liked catching eels, and they would end up in those famous pies, but probably using a little fork to trap the eels down in the shallows. Next slide, please. I wanted to think about Turner's close friends and patrons with whom he would have dined, and particularly starting with Walter Fawkes here on the right. Uh, Walter Fawkes was a Yorkshire landowner. He was uh, a liberal member of parliament. Uh, just for interest, he was anti-slavery. 
um, and he was an early patron of the younger Turner. Turner was invited up to Farnley on many occasions. This is Farnley is near Leeds, and so you have all that wonderful Yorkshire landscape for them to, to go out together um, shooting. And for Fawkes, Turner would also produce many amazing watercolors. You see here, Farnley Hall itself, uh, a watercolor painted for Walter Fawkes. Here is a painting by John Wildman showing Turner with Walter Fawkes at Farnley Hall. You see it in the distance. The bag, I think they've been out shooting, the bag appears to be a hare. Uh, guarded by a couple of gun dogs here. No doubt this is destined for the Varnley table, in this case, perhaps as part of a game pie. What you might call on the left an action painting, Turner's watercolour showing grouse shooting on Beamsley Beacon, quite close to Farnley Hall, uh, and Turner himself, the figure second from the right, striding out and enjoying uh, this, this sport with his patron. This is 1816, and on that, that year, Turner's traveling very widely in the north of England, but he ensured that he arrived at Farnley by the 12th of August, the glorious 12th, the opening of the grouse shooting season, and that is the sport they're all taking part in, I think in both of these watercolors. On the right, Turner has uh, painted this shooting party on the moors, Bottom right, you can see a large beer barrel. I think that would have been, uh, ale would have been a very important part of the enjoyment of the whole experience of a, of a shooting party. You can see Walter Fawkes uh, to, to the, to the, in the background in front of that temporary tent, but very elaborate lunches would have been set up. And you can also see the hunting dogs uh, who are supposed to retrieve the game and not in fact go off and eat it, as uh, was sometimes the case, I believe. Staying at Farnley for the moment, Turner contributed to Walter Falk's Book of Birds, the Farnley Book of Birds, around about 1820, where Fawkes was gathering together all kinds of information about wild birds, about game birds, and so on, compiling feathers, uh, Thomas Buick's wonderful woodcut illustrations, for instance, and Turner's watercolours added to this. There are wild birds, barn owls, finches, robins, and a peacock, perhaps from the Farnley Garden, but also a number that are clearly associated with the sport of shooting and, of course, the table. I'll spare you Turner's watercolours of the dead game birds, though he did paint the grouse he shot himself in 1816. And just giving you a couple uh, here, if you like, for a flavour. A turkey from the Farnley barnyard. No questions as to what that was uh, all about. And on the right, we have um, pheasants, a cock and a hen pheasant. A quick mention that in one of these sketchbooks, um, which is known as Woodcock Shooting, it contains many sketches, many of his own sketches for Sandicombe Lodge. So even while he's up at Farnley, if he has a little idea about his house, he will jot it down in that sketchbook. All of these would, of course, end up in that elegant dining room at Farnley Hall here, painted by Turner in 1818. A beautiful room. And it's interesting to think of Turner joining his patron and his Walter Fawkes' guests and family. And, and Fawkes' son recalled some of those visits and describes Turner enjoying fun, frolic, and shooting. And he also, the son, remembered that Turner, among friends, was as kindly-minded a man, as capable of enjoyment and fun of all kinds as any that I ever knew, as long as he was not disturbed when he was painting. Turner would also dine frequently at the Fawkes' London house in Grosvenor Place, and Mrs. Fawkes recorded his many, many visits for dinner and once for tea. Sadly, only in her usual economic style. In other words, she just writes down a date and Turner as a dinner guest. But at the marriage of the Fawkes' daughter in 1822 in London, Turner was one of the 23 guests at the dinner afterwards. And very unusually, 
Mrs. Fox added a comment, all tipsy. Walter Fox died in 1825. Turner never went finally again, but every Christmas time, his son would send Turner a hamper. In 1850, Turner, now an old man, he acknowledged with thanks the receipt of game, a brace of long tails and a hair. And in his letter back to Hawksworth Fawkes, he recalled his long ago visits. A cuckoo was my first achievement at killing on Farnley Moor. Possibly not quite by accident, Walter Fawkes wanted cuckoo, a cuckoo plumage for his um, book of birds. And in December the next year, a goose pie, and the goose pie was famous in Yorkshire, and game were already packed to send to Turner in London. But sad news was received at Farnley of Turner's death on the 19th of December, 1851. A rather different side to the production of food, agricultural labor. Frosty morning, a most beautiful painting here, an oil painting by Turner, around 1813. It is connected to those visits to Farnley. It was a scene that Turner had observed as he traveled to Yorkshire. And it's a clear-eyed depiction, not of upper-class sport or grand dining rooms, but of the hardship of agricultural labor as winter approaches. There's a hare in this painting as well. I put on the detail, I'm afraid it's gone a little bit pixelated in blowing it up. Uh, on the right, this time the hair has been shot. You can see just to the left of center, a man with a gun and the child with the hair draped around her neck. Um, and this again, perhaps for warmth, who knows that the hair might still have seen, been warm. Turner loved this painting and maybe as much as capturing the difficulty of, of farming in a frosty morning like this, he also wanted to capture that cold sunrise and the wonderful atmospheric effect that it gives to the sky. And similarly, plowing up turnips near Slough, what an unattractive title. Another wonderful oil painting. And again, wonderfully atmospheric. Mist is rising from the Thames, enshrouding Windsor Castle in all its grandeur, presiding over toiling figures beneath it. Turner again is, is not trying to make agricultural labor look remotely picturesque. It's not an Arcadian pastoral. It's almost the lowest form of, of food production. Matthew mentioned famines and poor harvests. In 1809, the Napoleonic Wars were still continuing. This year there were food shortages and poor harvests. But even then, turnips would probably not have arrived on the tables of the rich, but they would have been eaten by the poor or they would have been fed to cattle. And in fact, on the right in the foreground, you can see a pile of turnips and you can see a cow sniffing that heap, wondering whether to start helping herself, I think. This was, in fact, deemed rather an, an unpopular practice with the customers who complained that the milk tasted of turnips. It's not a particularly pleasant thought, but times were hard. You might just notice also to the left of the cow and the turnips, a, a small bottle and a small bundle. Some sustenance for one of the laborers that you see toiling away, trying to mend a broken, a broken plow. And Turner quite often depicts this basic form of food provision, the laborers taking up something to see them through a very long day. It's quite hard to know whether Turner sympathized with the difficulty of this kind of utterly backbreaking labor. If he did, he doesn't comment. We have no words from him to explain what he felt or whether he was simply entranced by that atmospheric mist rising from the Thames. But I'm just going to take the little hint of the, the bottle and the bundle, however humble it might have been, just to move us into picnics. And uh, a particular picnic, 1831, uh, just a few years after Turner had sold um, Sandy Coon. 
I think that when Turner went out on his fishing uh, expeditions, just going back to that little bottle and the portable food, uh, porter was a strong dark beer, and we know that cheese and porter were offered to his friend, the engraver John Pye, at Sandy Coombe. And when fishing with his friend, the sculptor Francis Chantry, the day would begin with bacon and eggs before they set off by boat to angle out the day. This is a, a breezy summer day and everyone enjoying, uh, I think, a late afternoon. This would be perhaps dinner time, early 19th century style, say around about five o'clock, bottom right hand corner of the watercolour. You have this group of rather well dressed people seated on rugs uh, around a tablecloth and a spread of food. And to the left, you can see a number of bottles on the ground. You can see all the paraphernalia of the picnic and you can see um, that other bottles are being uncorked. It's not possible to uh, work out exactly what they're eating, but in many ways, this is really evocative of an account of a friend who, in 1813, not long after Sandicum Lodge had been finished, um, Turner entertaining a friend, in fact, a large group of friends, who, according to William Wells, the painter, had dined under the elms at Ham, and then took coffee and tea at Turner's new house. They sang, they made music, and then, according to Wells, they concluded with good veal and fruit pies, beef and salad, and our tablecloth spread on the short grass in a lately mown field. We reposed after the Roman fashion on triclinia composed of the aforesaid hay. I don't think there's any hay for these finely dressed ladies here, but they certainly are all taking care that the grass is not going to mark their beautiful dresses. I think uh, Wells concluded this was one of the most delightful days I've ever spent. And perhaps Turner is trying to recapture those moments uh, here in this painting. Picnics were very fashionable in the early and mid 19th century. And in London in 1802, a picnic society was set up. The Royal Academy had its own picnic academical club. And in um, July 1819, we have Joseph Farrington recording a river outing of that club. I'll come back to that in a moment, but move to 1821, if we could have, when Turner played host and he wrote to the painter Abraham Cooper for the, the Academy's Picnic Academical Society. Dear sir, the second meter of the Picnic Ac Academical Club will take place at Sandicombe Lodge Twickenham on Sunday next at about three o'clock. Pray let me know in a day or two that the secretary may get something to eat. Yours truly, JMW Turner. For map, turn over to the other side. And this is the map on the other side of the invitation. You look down at the bottom, you'll see Richmond Bridge and you can see his shorthand for the bridge. He's written the Thames and then the road that goes to Isleworth with Sandy Coombe Lodge just tucked into that little triangle with the lane that ran past his front door. We don't know what the secretary provided by way of sustenance, but no doubt cold meats, pies and wine were a part of it. Um, so yes, a picnic on Eel Pie Island by Thomas Rowlandson. Matthew used a lot of Rowlandson's wonderful illustrations of early 19th century life. On, in 1819, this is the, the Picnic Academical Society and Joseph Farrington's record of this river outing. The river was a scene of much gaiety from the display of city barges and pleasure boats. We stopped at Barnes and in the boat had a loaf and cheese while the boatmen had fare at the inn. We then proceeded to the Eel Pie House at Twickenham where we landed a little after three o'clock and about four we sat down to excellent fare brought from the Freemasons Tavern under the management of a clever waiter. We dined in the open air at one table and removed to another to drink wine and eat fruit. Everything went off most agreeably. Before seven, we again embarked and rowed down the river, the tide in our favour and a full moon. 
Turner and Westmacott very loquacious on their way back. I think Turner was probably too loquacious to think of sketching on that particular occasion, but Romers, uh, Thomas Rowlandson, always alive to the foibles of the bourgeoisie, shows the hungry and thirsty hordes uh, arriving uh, at the at the eel pie house, uh, all looking for a picnic. And you can see the, the boat on the right, there are beer barrels, I think, being unloaded. No one is going to go short of an eel pie or uh, indeed a drink. We'll go to the kitchen at Santa Cum Lodge. And those of you who visited will know that this was presided over by Turner's father. And what you're seeing to the right of the fireplace is our projection of Turner's father. This is definitely his domain. He cultivated the garden there. Uh, although we think of him as being a Covent Garden barber, he was in fact born in Devon. And at Sandy Coombe, he seemed to take a great delight in cultivating the two acre garden. Turner's friend, Henry Trimmer, remembers meeting old William returning on foot from Brentford Market, a mere three miles away, held on Tuesdays, trudging home with his weekly provisions in a blue handkerchief. The Turners had relatives in Brentford, the Marshalls, Turner's mother was a Marshall, and these were butchers, so no doubt old William went there to, uh, to buy the, the food that he and his son would need, modest provisions. And again, I think from the Reverend Henry Trimmer and indeed also from his son, we get some recollections. Reverend Trimmer says he remembered him saying one day, oh dad, have you not any wine? Whereupon Turner Senior produced a bottle of currant, which Turner smelling said, why, what have you been about? The senior, it seemed, had overdone it with Hollands and it was set aside. At this time, Turner was a very abstemious person, perhaps having overindulged uh, a little on other occasions. I think that these references about the old fashioned cutlery and the tablecloth not big enough probably refer to those informal meals down in the kitchen where the ghost of Turner's father can bob up for you. Uh, this, beside the fireplace there. Certainly wine and porter were part of Sandy Coombe life. And if you look at the inventory of Turner's London house up in Marylebone, uh, there were barrels for beer down in that, that record. Hollands was the name for gin, of course, which old William clearly in, enjoyed and used it as a form of barter when he negotiated his lift up to Marylebone, Turner's London house, from the local market gardeners. He paid for this journey with a glass of gin. When old William's health began to decline, Turner took him back to London. And in 1826, in January, he wrote to his friend, James Holworthy, to thank him for a gift of turkey for Christmas. One all this has the image of Turner raking in turkeys at Christmas time from all sorts of different sources certainly going to have a good time then. And he wrote to Holworthy, your turkey was excellent. Many thanks to you and Mrs. H for it. Daddy, now being released from farming, that means gardening at Sandy Coon, thinks only of feeding. And he said its richness proved good land and good attention to domestic concerns. So the little dining room at Sandy Coon, perhaps where his friends were entertained slightly more formally, Turner didn't use his little country house to impress grand people or potential clients. But when among friends, and here's another uh, occasion here in that little but very pleasant room, particularly if the friends were artists, his artist friend, the painter C.R. Leslie, noticed that none was more joyous. And that reinforces the words of Walter Fawkes's son at Farnley. And I'm going to conclude with a banquet and indeed come back with, again, well, no longer the Prince Regent, but now George IV. This is Turner's oil sketch of an enormous banquet. We saw the Prince Regent caricatured as a voluptuary, and I think uh, with a fairly stretched waistcoat. And I think we're now almost 30 years later, aren't we, Matthew, from, from that particular uh, moment, I think the banquet uh, would stretch the waistcoat even further. 
George III died in 1822, and so the regent became king. Turner and a number of other artists were present at this extraordinary banquet when George IV arrived in Edinburgh, a banquet for 300 people laid on for him. Considerable challenges for a painter, uh, not least of which is this perspective plunging across the panel of this cavernous space and the great chandeliers hung from a great height above them. You can see the king seated under a canopy, seated in great state. And you might be able to make out here um, to on the, in the right, uh, a kneeling page boy presenting him with a silver dish of rose water. That's to rinse his fingers. I haven't found a menu for this occasion. If anyone else knows it, then I'd be very grateful. Please let me have it. But after George IV's coronation, a banquet was laid on at Westminster Hall and the food included, this is not an exhaustive list, soups, venison, veal, mutton, beef, braised ham, savory pies, geese, braised capon, lobster, crayfish, cold roast fowl, cold lamb, dishes of jellies and creams, all garnished from hundreds of sources. Sources, S-A-U-C-E-S. -E I'm guessing the finger rinsing came after eating lobster and crayfish. There is a table down to the left in the foreground. It's quite hard to make out what food is laid out on that serving table, but I think it does capture something of the flavor of that extraordinary occasion and the stretching of the royal waistcoat. I hope that has given you an appetite rather than taken it away. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you, Matthew. They're both incredibly nourishing presentations. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we have a few minutes for, for, for Q&A in just a moment. But before we move to that, I just want to draw your attention to um, the, the talks upcoming in the rest of the series. We go on until the 17th of November and we end with a talk about Soane at Pitsanger, and Soane, of course, was a great friend of Turner, so this is a beautifully takes us in, in, in a full circle. But you can see that the range of different properties, the range of different approaches they're taking to this theme of uh, food and drink. And if this talk has whetted your appetite uh, to become more involved with Turner's house, the small but, but beautifully formed and beautifully informative venue in, in Twickenham area, um, do visit the Turner's House website and you can find out more about volunteering either your time or your money to protect this amazing space.